morning, it's Sunday, July 7th, 724, and we're reading John in the Message Bible. This is the introduction. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God is presented as speaking the creation into existence. God speaks the word and it happens. Heaven and earth, ocean and stream, trees and grass, birds and fish, animals and humans, <laughs> Everything seen and unseen called into being by God's spoken word. In deliberate parallel to the opening words of Genesis, John presents God as a speaking salvation, as speaking salvation into existence. This time God's word takes on human form and enters history in the person of Jesus. Jesus speaks the word and it happens. Forgiveness and judgment, healing and illumination, mercy and grace, joy and love freedom and resurrection everything broken and fallen sinful and diseased called into salvation by god's spoken word for somewhere along the lines things went wrong genesis tells that story too and are in desperate need of fixing the fixing is all accomplished by speaking god speaking salvation salvation into the being in the person of jesus jesus in this account not only speaks the word of god he is the word of God. Keeping company with these words, we begin to realize that our words are more important than we ever supposed. Saying, I believe, for, instant, mar for instance, marks the difference between life and death. Wait, let me reread that. Saying, I believe, for instance, marks the difference between life and death. Our words accrue dignity and gravity in conversations with Jesus. For Jesus doesn't impose salvation as a solution. He narrates salvation into being through leisurely conversation, intimate personal relationships, <clears throat> compassionate responses, passionate prayer, and putting it all together, a sacrificial death. We don't casually walk away from words like that. What is this from? This is from John. He was in the family fishing business when Jesus invited his brother and him to join Jesus' circle of students. John became Jesus' closest friend, the only one of his male followers who dared showed up at his execution. He spent the next 50 years or more mulling over what he had seen and heard and eventually committed it to paper. His nickname as a young man was Thunderboy. But in the end, he thought of himself simply as the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> Who is this too? In later life, John took under his wing the young Christian communities in and around Ephesus, a bustling port city nearly a thousand miles from his home in Palestine. The Christians there were mostly non-Jews, some of them second and third generation believers. They needed a clear idea of what the Jewish Messiah had to do with them. Philosophers and religion peddlers of every flavor streamed through Ephesus, and Christians had to sort out all of that and decide what beliefs they would bet their lives on. As the only surviving witness of Jesus' words and deeds, John was a treasure. Uh, this was written roughly A.D. 27 to 30, a library of scrolls written between 200 B.C. and A.D. 100 were hidden in caves in the desert near the Dead Sea. Surviving fragments were rediscovered in 1947. Some of the Dead Sea scrolls were written by a Jewish sect or sects, waiting for an end times battle between the Son of Light and the sons of darkness, or the sons of light and the sons of darkness. They also speak of a teacher of righteousness. These ideas were current and wholly debated while Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem. Oh, hotly debated. These ideas were current and hotly debated while Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem. Okay, this is John chapter 1, the life light. The word was first, the word present to God, God present to the word, the word was God, 
in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, <clears throat> pardon me, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. This life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness couldn't put it out. There was once a man, his name was John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world, the world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God's selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten. Not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The world became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true, from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, this is the one, the one I told you was coming after, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact is ahead of me. He's always been ahead of me. He's always had the first word. We all live off of his generous bounty, gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and then this exuberant giving and receiving this endless knowing and understanding. And all this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This one of a kind God expression who exists the very heart of the father has made him as plain as day. Thunder in the desert. When Jews from Jerusalem sent a group of priests and officials to ask John who he was, he was, he was completely honest. He didn't evade the question. He told the plain truth. I am not the Messiah. They pressed him. Who then, Elijah? I am not. The prophet? No. Exasperated, they said. Who then? We need an answer for those who sent us. Tell us something, anything about yourself. I'm thunder in the desert. Make the road straight for God. I'm doing what the prophet Isaiah preached. Those sent to question him were from the Pharisee party. Now, they had a question of their own. If you're neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet, why do you baptize? John answered, I only baptize using water. A person you don't recognize has taken his stand in your midst. He comes after me, but he's not in second place to me. I'm not even worthy to hold his coat for him. These conversations took place in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing at the time. The God Revealer. The very next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and yelled out, Here he is! God's Passover lamb. He forgives the sins of the world. This is the man I've been talking about, the one who comes after me, but is really ahead of me. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get Israel ready to recognize him as the God revealer. This is why I came here baptizing with water, giving you a good bath and scrubbing sins from your life so that you can get a fresh start with God. John clinched his witness with this. I watched the spirit like a dove flying down out of the sky, making himself at home in him. I repeat, I know nothing about him except this, the one who authorized me to baptize with water told me, the one on whom you see the spirit come down and stay, this one will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I saw happen. And I'm telling you, there's no question about it. This is the son of God. Come see for yourself. The next day, John was back at his post with two disciples who were watching. He looked up, saw Jesus walking nearby and said, here he is, God's Passover lamb. The two disciples heard him and went after Jesus. Jesus looked over his shoulder and said, what are you after? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He replied, come along and see for yourself. They came, saw where he was living and ended up staying with him for the day. 
It was late afternoon when this happened. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John's witness and followed Jesus. The first thing he did after finding where Jesus lived was find his own brother Simon telling him, we found the Messiah, that is Christ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Jesus took one look up and said, you're John's son, Simon? Well, from now on, your name is Cephas or Peter, which means rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, come follow me. Philip's hometown was the Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Nazareth, you've got to be kidding. But Philip said, come see for yourself. When Jesus saw him coming, he said, there's a real Israelite, not a false bone in his body. Nathanael said, where did you get that idea? You don't know me. Jesus said, one day, long before Philip called you here, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus said, you've become a believer simply because I say I saw you one day sitting under the fig tree. You haven't seen anything yet. Before this is over, you're going to see heaven open and God's angels descending to the Son of Man and ascending again. Chapter 2, From Water to Wine. Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him, They're just about out of wine. Jesus said, Is that any business of ours, mother? Is that any of our business, mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time, don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Six stoneware water pots were there, used by the Jews for ritual washing. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now, fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom, everybody I know begins with their finest wines, and after the guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff, but you saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign that Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum along with his mother, brothers, and disciples and stayed several days. Tear down this temple. When the Passover feast, celebrated each spring by the Jews, was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and doves. The loan sharks were also there in full strength. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and cattle, upending the tables of the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. He told the dove merchants, get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. That's when his disciples remembered the scripture, zeal for your house consumes me. <laughs> but the Jews were upset. They said, or they asked, what credentials can you present to justify this? Jesus answered, tear down this temple and in three days I'll put it back together. They were indignant. It took 46 years to build this temple and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as the temple. Later, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. They then put two and two together and believed both what was written in the scripture and what Jesus had said. During the time that he was in Jerusalem, those days of the Passover feast, many people noticed the signs he was displaying and seeing that they pointed straight to God and trusted their lives to him. But Jesus didn't entrust his life to them. He knew them inside and out, knew how untrustworthy they were. He didn't need any help in seeing right through them. And that's it. We'll stop here. We've read chapter one and two from John. 
have a happy Sunday.